Welcome back to Just Giants with Grump and the Cranky Fan, the best damn podcast for the best damn football team. I am your host of Football Grump, and with me as always is Mike the Cranky Fan. How's it going, Mike? Oh, Grump. Tonight started the hockey playoffs. My lightning got shellacked. So uh, not in the greatest of moods right now to start off the week. But we have late night rays that just started playing out in Oakland, so I'll be up mighty late. So long playoff run, but I'm not in the best of moods right now. I'm sure you're in a better mood than both Chris Pettit and Kyle (laughs) O'Brien, former Giants employees. If you try to look up their profiles on Giants.com, you will get a 404 error because they are not currently (laughs) employed. Um, Big news. Jumping jumping right into the news today. We're going to do it. So um, we're going to get into that in just a second. But first, uh, we are going to get into – well, afterwards – we're going to get into the draft. We're going to kind of just do a light overview. This is not going to be super analytical because I'm going to be honest with you, 100% honest. I am frustrated from this draft. I have worked my ass off. I did not count every single player that I watched, but it looks like it's close to 200 names. And well, there were like five guys the Giants drafted that I did not do work on. Well, Grump, the last time I checked on LinkedIn, I didn't notice you were a professional scout. Or well, that's your, true. No, but or I'm, your I professional am. podcaster either. So I no, think I, uh, I mean, like, no one's really given me shit for it. I'm just frustrated because I did all that work, yeah. and it it was I wouldn't say down the toilet, but I thought it would come in handy well, for this purpose. I think I'm going to speak for all of our loyal listeners and watchers on YouTube and and the, the assorted podcast platforms are on that uh, we have learned a lot from all your analysis and work the last uh, several months. Work, I mean. You know, I prepare a lot for this show, but you prepare a shit ton, and you really have done a lot. You've made me a lot smarter as a Giant fan. Hopefully, the people out there. I mean, I think the work you've done with, you know, Bobby and Justin over at um, Talking Giants, I think is, you know, I think you made that their, you know, live feeds during the draft a lot better. And uh, so, don't I wouldn't, I wouldn't be frustrated at all. Uh, I think you did a great job, and we all want to thank you for that. I, I I appreciate that, and that was there was a lot of fun. Um, it, it, there's always a lot of knowledge floating around that room, uh, so that that was cool to be there and uh, in the studio with everybody, and good to see Justin and Bobby again, and Danny King, who I get to see even less. Yeah, um, yeah. It was a lot of fun, honestly. Uh, just to, uh, I guess, be with other people in the draft where you can be equally nervous and excited, and uh, you know whatever. Um, it was a lot of fun. Uh, it was it was very exciting, and uh, I I hope we get to do that again next year. That that would be a lot of fun. Um, yeah. But that being said, I don't want to sit here and bullshit you into a, uh, a a a deep dive into some players that I truly didn't do a deep dive on yet. So that will be tabled until next week's show. But for now, I do want to take a look at how this draft was approached, kind of recap it, and uh, just kind of compare it to how we kind of would have done things etc but first let's get into this chris pettit and kyle o'brien news so this is brand new today right this just happened a couple of hours ago yeah we're recording this on monday night and uh broke about probably seven o'clock this evening yeah i mean it was just when i was uh driving from the gym to the grocery store when you texted me so (laughs) Around seven o'clock, uh, Grump. Uh, I love the fact you're always referencing going to the gym. We, we could see those arms of yours. And that, you know? this, that's not a flex at all. I, it's you just, must be, yeah, it's obviously not a flex. No, what I'm so. saying is, if if I didn't have a reaction on Twitter, it's because I was actually doing something in that moment. Those those <laughs> rare moments I am out of the house, and it's always to the same fucking place. But yeah, so you texted me that as I was driving from one place to the next, whatever, um, and. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. Okay, so real quick, who are Chris Pettit and Kyle O'Brien? Chris Pettit is currently the director of college scouting. Uh, he has held well, that he's position. Formally. To, he's not, well, cur- he's not he, currently. Yeah, he, yeah he, is, he is currently, uh, I'm sure, drinking a beer. Um, but uh, <laughs> he, he was most recently the director of college scouting for the New York Giants, a position he held since 2018. Prior to that, from 2004 until then, he was just a scout for the Giants. So that was a big leap up for him. Uh, Kyle O'Brien was recently brought in last year uh, for a brand new position that they titled Senior Personnel Director. Prior to that, he was a Lions VP Player Personnel um, 
from like 2016 to 2020, but he was more known for his connection to Joe Judge and his time in New England where he was an evaluator of some kind for Bill Belichick. Mm -hmm. Um, They are both now gone. Now, Kyle O'Brien was sort of brought in, like I said, with that Joe Judge thing. Chris Pettit was elevated uh, in 2018 when Dave Gettleman took over. So Dave Gettleman, of course, was a scout and a, a, you know, uh, well, he was a, he was a college scout when he was here with the Giants. So this was a right. guy he worked with. He elevated. These are former lieutenants that are now out. What I like is the timing here, right? Well, yeah. I mean, when when you, a new GM comes in, they want to clean house. They want to bring in their guys, you know, at different levels, whether it's strategic up at the top or tactical down at the scout level. But you know, we're in a cycle. You know, and at the eleventh hour, you can't all of a sudden replace people. You know, in scouting, evaluation, preparation for the draft, you kind of have to play it out until it actually occurs, and then, then you make your moves for next year. So I, I, I think, I think we all kind of knew this was going to happen. I think we all also kind of knew this is when it was going to happen too. Yeah, and I'm glad it happened now, right? So this is Mm -hmm. not exactly what happened when Joe Shane was brought into Buffalo. What happened in Buffalo was a little bit chaotic, in my opinion, and I think a flawed approach to changing of guards, right? So what Mm -hmm. happened was in 2017, I think it was, um, the the prior GM, they handled everything all the way through the free agency first wave and the draft and on may like 7th or 8th or 9th or something like that or right after the draft they're shit canned all of them and in mm-hmm. comes brandon bean after a whole wave of draft picks went through now i i can understand the thought process here right because you don't want to have your whole scouting department and all the work they've done all college season to be trashed. Also, you don't want all those notes now out there available for employment at other teams, rival teams. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So there's there's a there's a reason you hang on to these people and in such an awkward time, right? Like there is a out of syncness to hirings and firings with the season and then the off season. Um, but to me, the way the Giants did this here was the best way to do it. You bring in Joe Shane early. You let him get started. You keep the scouts. You keep whoever around. You let him bring in a couple lieutenants his own way, and you lean on the coaches and those lieutenants. You let everybody else audition to keep their jobs or get promoted or do whatever. And then after the draft, you fire who you want to fire. It's probably always going to be the top lieutenants of the prior regime just because of that. It doesn't even matter if they're good or bad at their job. But mm-hmm. likely you're not going to agree with their philosophy. Since well, there was a changing of guard, the team sucked. Of course there was. there's going to be some issues there. But Well, I think there was two main messages that were sent with this. It's number one, this is Joe Shane's team. And well, that too, yeah. You know something, this is not something where, you know, the mayor has, you know, said, hey, you know, put pressure on them to keep these guys around. You know, they're, you know, uh, what's the name has been here since 2004. That's almost a lifer in NFL terms, Mm -hmm. you know, survived how many three general managers from 2004? Uh does that count? Is it 2004 isn't a Corsi? Oh, yeah, it is. It's a Corsi. Yeah, we're going back to a Corsi. So, yeah, so technically, you know, yeah. It, it's, it's a very good sign in, a, in messaging that this is Joe Shane's. He's the boss. He is running the operation. He's seeing as he sees fit. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's very, very important that he's being allowed to make the moves that he wants to do. Uh, you know, if it was again, if it was something where he has even like one of his hands tied behind his back, where you need to keep these people in place, that could cause problems down the road. And, and the second thing is he's getting people that, you know, all the ships are now sailing in alignment. You know, these are guys up top who he's picking. You know, from the 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 thought process, the evaluation process, the, the decision making process, they can all be aligned. They're all you know his handpicked guys. So. You know, scouting, scouting is scouting. To me, it's evaluation of those scouting reports that's important. So I don't think, I don't know how much their drafts are going to change as much, you know, based upon the, 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 the scouting services they have and the and the people they have. I think at the end of the day, it's still the evaluation of that and making the right call. And that comes from the general manager. Um, but definitely uh, perception-wise, it feels like we are still cleaning house. And when you've been as bad as we've been for the last decade, 
that's the right message you want to send to your fan base and the rest of the league. Yeah, I mean, it is a big deal, right, that they, mm-hmm. they got rid of a Giants lifer like that. Like Kyle O'Brien, his, his – his death sentence was probably around week three. I mean, once once we saw it was an 0-3 season, it was almost a sure thing that he was going to be gone. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just a matter of whether or not Joe Shane was going to be able to do enough to save... Uh, sorry, uh, Joe Judge was going to be able to do enough to save his job and justify keeping him. Um, but, I mean, he, his ship had sailed. I'm sure he was kind of half-assing probably the rest of his job. I don't know. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean... I, I mean... <laughs> The you get my point. I'm being very sarcastic small league. here. There's only 32 teams, and if you're half-assing, that's going to get around the league really quickly, and you won't get I, your I, next job. I'm being I'm being sarcastic. I, I was oh. <laughs> making basically a senioritis joke there. Uh, he pretty much knew he was being kicked out the door, but yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I guess I mean the other thing is, and I don't I don't know any truth to this, but Chris Pettit I believe is linked to a lot of the Giants leaks from inside the organization. I know some people have connected him to – I think people might be reaching a bit here, but connecting him to Pat Leonard's sources, um, potentially the Kadarius Tony trade is a, a, a leak. So do you think that they smoked out a false a, an story? An internal person? I guess it could be. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, like paranoid, I said, I don't – Paranoid me thinks something like that, but uh, who knows? Yeah, I could see some truth to that, but I don't see any actual evidence other than like fan speculation of that to Mm -hmm. really glean anything from it. And ultimately, I think you can say that Chris Pettit is probably just not good at his job as a reason enough to fire him. Well, I mean, how would Chris Pettit really know what the plan is for Kadarius Tony If he's involved in scouting and, you know— he, he, I don't think he would in the day-to-day operations unless, you know, he had word from Joe Shane, like, I need something on the, the top wide receivers. We're going to shop. Kid-. You know what I mean? I, I guess it could be a setup, right? Well, that you, would you be could, a You real... couldn't see him, like, walking into his office Thursday before. It's like, listen, we just got, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to start shopping Kadarius Tony. I'm going to need a lot more information on wide receivers in this draft, you know, whatever. Just, you know, keep this between you and me. You know what I mean? I, I could see that in a Hollywood I, I kind guess. of – You know what I'm saying? It's a, it sounds saw, a little outlandish. You saw in the, in the post-draft press conference the uh, the reaction that Joe Shane had when – Pat uh, Leonard asked him about Tony. Exactly, yeah. That was the best – You know, I, I was – I did say that when Gettleman got fired, I was going to be upset that we wouldn't have his press conferences anymore because he is a soundbite machine. But Joe Shane just dropped the mic <laughs> super hard. I mean, that was like an audible His bitch like, slap. Oh. Yeah. I mean, it was like the most disappointed dad answer. Like like just having to tell his idiot son like the same thing three times, you know? Mm-hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I buy that that's, that was like a setup for the leak within the organization. Or if he just sucks at his job, I think is good enough reason to fire him. I, I, I just think it's... <laughs> You want your own guys, mm. you know, you, when you have, when you're a general manager, when you're the VP of football operations, when you're an owner, when you're a head coach, you earn the right to bring in your people to support you, who share your vision, who you work well together, people you've always wanted to work. And that's what you get. So it might just be as simple as that. And, you know, again, the messaging was that we were going to, uh, you know, let Joe Shane run the ship, and you know, Mero is going to try to be a little more hands off than he might have been before, and this is just more messaging that he's doing that. Yeah, um, but so I, I would expect some hires to come in the in the coming days. Um, as that happens, I guess we'll we'll probably have like an episode, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know. I mean, it depends on who's hired and for what position. If it's something like. Yeah, I don't know. A college scouting director? I don't know. Is that really super important news? It's not earth-shattering. I don't know. Maybe we'll do an episode. Unless we'll we, definitely unless we cover can, it. But. If we can poach somewhere from a team that, you know, always does well in the draft and does a really good evaluation, then, yeah, it might be interesting. But, uh... Yeah. Well, I mean, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it when it happens. Yeah, yeah. Um, but let's get into the more exciting news from this weekend. We had a wonderful... Uh, event the draft is so much fun i think even people who don't watch it enjoy the results of the draft 
and think it's fun, right? Yeah, you know, unfortunately for me, it's always this weekend, and it's you know, it's I said it before, it's my 15th wedding anniversary, and we had a really great weekend, you know, doing lots of stuff around the city. Um, but unfortunately, it gets me a little disconnected from the actual draft. I mean, thank God we live in an age where, and I have a wonderful wife who lets me have the phone with me. She can't see, but so I was pretty connected. <laughs> but you know, it's uh, I, 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 it's not it's not as easy just to kind of sit on the couch and be like, oh, what's going on here or anything. So, um, but as far as I'm concerned, I know people. Re- Gauging from people's emotions on giant Twitter, they were over the over the moon for Thursday and quickly got super pissed on Friday. And I think we need to kind of, as we always try to do on this show, level set. And uh, what was your overall reaction from Thursday to Saturday? Well, I mean, it's hard for me to have a genuine reaction. Um like I said, the, the Giants managed to select guys I just simply didn't do work on, and I, I hate relying on uh, other people's work. You know, uh, there's people I respect and I trust, but I do want to see things for myself before I develop my own opinion. So it was hard for me to have like a genuine like reaction to to player and selections. When I, I gotta don't be honest with are, you but... too, that is the answer I'd like to hear from most people, <laughs> if not all, because yeah. again. We all, you know, and, and you, you know, we do this for a living. We really don't, but I mean, we spend a lot more time probably than a lot of, you know, giant fans do of, of evaluating talent, evaluating, you know, but we're really spending a lot of our time at the, with those top picks, and the vast majority of people that I think have a reaction, especially the negative reaction, is, well, I'm just not familiar with this guy, and well, I know it's, this it's guy more, is on a big yeah, board that I'm exactly. following. And rather than be annoyed that it wasn't someone that you thought should be picked because some writer or podcast host says was on their board, take a minute to figure out, A, who the player was that was drafted, what his skill set is, how that skill set's going to fit into what we're trying to do, how does that, and we're going to talk about this going forward, how does that fit into our needs, our priorities, must have would like to have, need to have, all those things. So, and also, I also think it's incredibly stupid that we, you know, grades. How do we grade what the Giants did? How the first round go? How do we grade that? Couldn't tell you until these guys actually play. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, we never see, and I say this every year, I've yet to see an article that gives a, a, a report card for the 2018 draft. Have you seen one that goes from pick by pick and says, you know, A plus, B, C minus, D? They usually oh. – well, I mean, now they'll come out – like beat writers will do it in like the dead season in like July. You know what I mean? Or like if there's like a, a, a checkpoint in time, like, okay, the GM gets fired and, you know, it's this like, is what he said in 2018 when he took over. Let's take a look at his, you know, what, yeah, you know, what but do you it's mean? Like Stuff like of, that. But it's, it's, but it's kind of like when you watch, when you, watch uh, you know – game day on Saturday and Sunday mornings on ESPN where these guys all make their picks. Yeah. Well, did, were they right? Were they wrong? I mean, somebody tell me what Kirk Herbstreet's record was on a Saturday or, you know, uh, Randy Moss or something. We don't know. They make picks and that's the end of it. So it's, it's kind of the same thing for me. It's like, okay, people grade, and I, this is one of my biggest criticism too, they grade upon what they expect you know, based upon a board that's not the board that matters, which is the Giants' big board, and it's probably because people get the people get the most pissed because they were wrong, and they're trying to justify. You know, I give this a shitty grade because I didn't pick it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's hard for us to judge what other teams. I mean, the the real thing comes down to if you both view the team and the players the same way, which no one ever will. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like you will never perceive your needs the same way the outside world will because they don't know the players like you like you know them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they won't 
know that you didn't pick a running back because you had faith in this guy and you know what he's capable of because you've seen it up close. He just hasn't put it all together. He couldn't learn the playbook, couldn't see the field. I don't know, whatever. But so you know that, so you don't draft a running back. The whole world thinks you're stupid because you need a running back, but you think you've got or, one right there. Now, whether you're right or wrong, they're not going to know that was the reason that you didn't Or the take bigger it. thing is, why do you take this linebacker when this guy was still available? Oh, yeah. Well, there's that, too. Um, that That's what really drives me more crazy. It's like the position thing, that's, that's the eye of the beholder. But to me, it's the – I don't understand why we reached for this receiver. And they act like reaching for receiver means you drafted somebody in the second round that is either a second-round pick or a third-round pick, not a second-round pick or an undrafted free agent. It's like this guy – you yeah. even drafted. You're taking him in the second round. That might be something where you're like, "What are you doing?" But well, then everybody... also, but like second round to third round, that comes down to per- like how you perceive that player. Like maybe maybe Todd McShay thinks that this person is a third round pick, but yeah. pretty sure that most other NFL teams see him as a second round pick. But it's so also I'm kind of taking that a little bit too between a second and a third or a second exactly. and a fourth. Yeah. Even it's picking nits. Is again, if it's somebody that nobody thought would be drafted. And all of a sudden, we just took this guy in the second round. Well, okay, then you could scratch your head and say, what are you doing? But, you know, what's the name that the Giants drafted the second round uh, receiver? Yeah, yeah, we're, we're, we're rambling now. Let's, 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 let's get on track here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I mean, my, my, my final point is it's a guy that PFF said was the highest rated receiver in the SEC. Yeah. That's not somebody that's a non-drafted free agent that we reached on. It's just, I don't know, it just gets a little... Just, I, I get it. So let's let's Theatrical. go through let's let's go through the draft here. Let's let's go through mm-hmm. Thursday, Friday, and all this other shit instead of just okay. talking around it. Um, so Thursday night, the Giants had picks five and seven. We fully expected, you know, a possibility of a trade down, whatever. What ended up happening ended up being uh, what was kind of reported right beforehand was the top three picks went the way I had heard rumored actually, mm-hmm. uh, with Trayvon Walker, Aiden Hutchinson, and then. Um, Derek Stingley, which left the the Giants in a in a plethora of riches here, um, and they wound up taking Kayvon Thibodeau at pick five, um, leaving a choice of tackles for the Carolina Panthers at six, and then whatever fell to them at seven, which was Evan Neal. Uh, going into now we've already covered that. Um, yeah. Going into round, day two here, round two, they traded pick thirty six down. With Wait, the hold Jets. on one second before we get to the second round. We didn't cover this, and we talked about the, the day one draft. Any concerns? We, we've been bringing up the little concern we had about paying for all these guys. Yeah, absolutely. I have a concern with that. Because that we're, gonna have, we're going to do that. Yeah, and also we're talking about guys that are you know high-profile guys in high-profile positions and things. So you know, I, I'm sure it will be sorted out like later on, but uh, the, the trading down factor of, of, of you know, deferring those picks to later is not there right now. Yeah, and it's going to come down to either cutting Bradbury flat out to make it work or finding a way to extend him or something. But that mm-hmm. it, di- it didn't work the way we had hoped. But, um, you know, which was to probably trade Bradbury and some kind of pick compensation to get the contract off the books and get something in return. Um, but I, I guess there were no bites. But if, but if you ask me, though, it's something you said, hope, something we had hoped had happened, I'll take what happened behind door number one of getting these two guys and we'll deal with it later as opposed to not getting these two guys and being able just to get rid of Bradbury. I think for the long-term health of this team. Well, probably. Yeah, probably for the long-term mm-hmm. health. But anyway, all right. So day two, pick two, uh, round two. They p- pick 36. They traded to the Jets for pick 38 and 146, which is a fifth round pick. So they picked up an extra fifth. Then they traded pick 38 to Atlanta for pick 40, 43. And 114. So then they picked up a fourth. So they turned their second round pick into a second round pick, a fourth round pick, and a fifth round pick. And they used that second round pick for Wandale Robinson from Kentucky. Round three, they used pick 67 on Josh Zudu, uh, a guard from North Carolina, and pick 81 for Cordell Flott, a defensive back from LSU. Moving into the last day, uh, round four, they had two picks because they picked up one. Uh, pick 112, they picked Daniel Bellinger, tight end from San Diego State, and pick 114, Dane Belton, safety from Iowa. 
round five. They had 146, 147, and 173, which they used on Micah McFadden, linebacker from Indiana, DJ Davidson, a nose tackle from Arizona State, and Marcus McKethan, a guard from North Carolina, the other one. Um, and then finally, in round six, pick 182, they picked Darian Beavers, the inside linebacker from Cincinnati. So that was a quick recap of their draft. Now, because I don't know all these players well enough to tell you if I think it's a good pick or how they're going to fit in this defense, I can only really guess and surmise. So why don't we just compare it to what we thought the musts, mm-hmm. the must come away with column the needs to come away with column and the strongly consider column uh as they fit in with with positions and kind of on the depth chart here and 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 these are going to be kind of just projections here this isn't going to be um accurate or you know whatever but projections is all we really have right? right so what i outlined my musts as starting right tackle starting corner and safety now you had said that you would swap out i believe safety for edge or was it corner for edge uh safety for edge okay so um in this regard you were more uh, i would say i mean whether it was the way that, yeah well yeah so whether it's the way the board fell because the jets took ahmad gardner and prior to that the texans picked Derek stingley so the top two corners were right off the board when they were picking so mm-hmm. if it's because the board fell that way or because the team actually saw the needs the exact same way you did they hit two of those musts for you right off the bat they hit Kayvon thibodeau the second best pass rusher here he would be the best pass rusher on the team right off the bat probably he'll be able to uh allow aziz ojalari to have more one-on-one opportunities maybe mm-hmm. against some lesser tackles which would allow him for some more success uh leonard williams as well will probably see more success in this system because of Kayvon thibodeau's presence and what he's able to do at right tackle evan neal is not just a clear upgrade over Matt Gano. It would be the best right tackle this team has had. He's probably better than, um, oh my Christ, Kareem McKenzie. Probably, you know, yeah. who, who was the best right tackle we last had. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in, in his waning years was getting hurt a lot and wasn't really that good. But right. And his best years was a solid right tackle. Was pro- you know, this is the best shape the trenches have been in a long time, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, absolutely. Bet- as far as corner goes, and- though. <laughs> What's that? As far as corner goes, though, uh, maybe not so much. Uh, they went out and they grabbed Cordell Flott from LSU. Now, Cordell Flott was somebody I don't really know anything about, so I had to do some reading. I'll do some actual watching to kind of give an opinion. But my initial opinion is he's probably not going to start just because he doesn't have the experience. He's 20 I, years old, super young, left LSU because it's a shit show, right? Yeah. I mean, I think the same story I'm going to have about LSU, I'm going to talk about guys from Florida and guys like uh, Kyrie Elam and stuff that they were in a very bad situation of coaching. You know, there are a lot of talent on both teams, you know, all over between, you know, the defensive line, secondary. But what you see on film is going to be a lot of as a result of poor coaching, poor scheme. Not so much, you know, a reflection of them personally. So, you know, again, I saw that LSU team in person this year. Um, the defense was a mess. I mean, both teams were a complete mess. But there are individual talent on there. And I think once we watch the film with a guy like him, you're going to see what he can do and what upside he, he has, you know, as he gets better coaching and more stability in coaching, too. Yeah, so the other thing that works against him is that because of the amount of injuries on LSU last year, he kind of played all over the place. Played mm-hmm. some safety in the slot. I mean, he just played all over the place. Doesn't help his experience, doesn't help his film. The biggest thing for him really is that, A, he's 20 years old, um, and uh, B, he's only 175 pounds. He's 6 feet, 175, is way too thin. Um, needs to hit the weight room like super duper hard, which is mm-hmm. why I think he doesn't really have much of a role to start this year. Um, you know, James Bradbury's status aside, you know, we don't, he's currently a giant, so I can't say, uh, he would, you know, whatever isn't here, but, um, Cordell Flott is a future. Um, he is probably a talent that they are betting on and not so much a sure thing like I felt that they needed. Um, if James Bradbury is gone, I cannot say that I would expect him to start. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he'll compete. 
you know, everyone's going to compete. But, I mean, right. you know, is that how you feel as well? This I agree. Is more Rodarius Williams and Aaron Robinson playing the right. outside thing. And he'll be in the rotation, and we can see how he does in camp and everything and how fast he's brought along. But I agree. Yeah. Oh, and one more thing not a plug I forgot to mention. Up. No, I, I don't think so. But like I said, everyone's going to compete and have their shot. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and I think that Wink Martindale is going to need a lot of DBs. He might see some playing time and not a whole bunch or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but I did see that Lance Zerline had said that he projects as an outside corner on the perimeter, not anywhere else. So, I mean, like, I'll have to do that work myself, but that's what he thinks. Wink Martindale, is he the type of guy that he doesn't – there's a lot of coaches that kind of like, I like experienced guys. And if you're young, you're going to wait your turn, regardless if you're the better talent or not. Is he shown trends in the past of someone that plays, you know, not necessarily meritocracy, but just, you know, a seniority thing? I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. I'm sorry. Okay. Um, I think, I think he's likely to play talent. You know what I mean? I, I don't think he's one to play a seniority thing. Um, I guess the decision comes down to guys he trusts versus guys who have the talent. You know what I mean? Like who's going to be in the right place at the right time or who's just going to be a, an all-talent guy that I can't necessarily trust, right? That's yeah, kind of more of the that, question. That's kind of, a, that's kind of a code word for me when I hear trust of I trust the older guys. More. Right, right. I, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know the answer to that. But I think that he – I think he's a young guy player, but I, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Um. Now, I viewed my needs here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So I, I, I viewed a must as safety, um, and I don't feel that they came away with a safety must. Um, and again, this could be the way the board fell, though Jaquan Brisker was sitting on the board day two. So that was kind of weird to me. Uh, they, they traded down until they couldn't get him. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I think they even picked Wandell Robinson over him. I don't really remember, but uh, it doesn't matter. They clearly passed over taking him. Uh, Dane Belton is who we got. Now, Dane Belton I don't necessarily have a problem with in the fourth round. Um, Has some traits. He is somebody I did do work on, actually. Um, Has some traits that Wink Martindale is going to like in terms of blitzing and and just, you know, having the raw speed and that kind of thing. But he's a little wild, a little out of control. He doesn't look super polished. And this safety class really wasn't all that great to begin with. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have to re-review his blitzing because my notes say that he was kind of not a finisher at blitzing. Everybody else seems to disagree, so I'll re-watch and see if I'm right or (laughs) or wrong. I I mean, I could just respectfully disagree, but when so many people disagree with me, it's a good chance I screwed that one up. But that's so we'll we'll see. Like I said, I wasn't, you know, whatever. But uh, so, but what I do think is, and we'll get into this in a second, is that Dane Belton is quality depth at safety that with with the chance to improve well enough to be a starter i'll say that much about him okay um now going into the needs here i had edge in here but we can cross that one off since we already discussed it but the other needs i had for this team coming out of the draft were tight end left guard and inside linebacker um Mm -hmm. in regards to tight end they picked up daniel bellinger from san diego state uh, he's definitely somebody who's going to compete right away. I wouldn't say he's a clear starter over Ricky Seals Jones or Jordan Atkins. Um, but I do think that his ability to block and his size will help him compete. And I think the best guy is going to get the starting reps in this position. And we're more interested, you know, when we get to week 15, 16, is this guy going to be the starter as opposed to week one? I mean, we're drafting, he's young, he'll be a rookie. Let's see how he develops throughout the year. Absolutely. This draft was one where there weren't a whole lot of day one starters at tight end. There were very (laughs) few, actually. Um, There was just a bunch of guys who could be day one contributors. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think think that he would be a day one contributor. Um, We'll see as the season goes on how he develops and how much he goes into the plan. But this is definitely a a position that they're going to continue to upgrade in the coming years. Uh, Mm -hmm. Next year, I think they'll invest a little bit more heavily in it and let Bellinger be more the sidekick to that person. But we'll see. You know, we could be completely wrong. Bellinger might be a baller. Who knows? Right, right. Um, At left guard, they picked up Josh Azudu. Now, this was unfortunately a super important position for me, and they picked a guy I didn't do any work on. And I'm kicking myself for this one because normally I would have the foresight to think a team with a top running game the last couple of years should probably check out their interior o-line guys right i mm-hmm. didn't um 
Josh Azudu did play multiple positions. He did have some flexibility to play tackle at times, but projects as a pretty good left guard with the ability to improve with his hand placement. I'll have to check that out. But right now, I think he's right in the mix to compete with Shane Lemieux and Max Garcia for that left guard position. I think the best man is going to win that spot. Mm -hmm. You feel the same way with that, with a third-round pick at at guard? A third-round pick at guard should be able to compete for the starting job, especially against... You know, especially against the incumbents who are coming in, guys that were hurt, guys that were, eh. Yeah. You know, we, Max Garcia, we we kind of got off the, you know, off the scrap, scrap heap a little heap. bit. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I should... saw a lot of uh, Cardinals fans saying that is pretty much an even trade for Bull Hernandez, in terms of their abilities. Uh, Cardinal so, Twitter thinks Will Hernandez is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Well, also. okay, I, I yes, they did, but I'm I'm saying the more realistic ones were like, eh, Max Garcia is about it even with Will Hernandez. It's you're not going to be that thrilled with him. So, well, I mean, but so his role on this team is to be that bridge as we build. You know, we draft guys into there too. So, Absolutely. if it could be a decent enough stopgap for this year alone, and provide depth, hopefully, you know, in the best case scenario. I'll take him as a depth guy. Yeah. And he'll just be somebody that can take the time to grow a little bit. Exactly. Um, and now at linebacker, they went and got Darian Beavers, who's more of a uh, traditional old school thumper of a linebacker, which in weak Martindale system, he'll be able to stop the run like that. But also I think he'll be able to use it just blitz packages. You can just, just get the quarterback. You know what I mean? Just run forward, hit people, get them out of your way. But they mm-hmm. also got Micah McFadden, from Indiana, who I actually did work on as well, and I did really like. And I'll do a more in-depth thing, like I said, uh, in the coming episodes, but definitely uh, will help as a blitzer in those packages as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and I I don't feel like... I, I feel like inside linebacker is adequate right now. Um, you know, with Blake Martinez and Tay Crowder, we have two guys. One's coming off injury, but normally would be like a captain of the team. You got another dude who has managed to hang around as Mr. He's Irrelevant. He's, he's held on to that now. He's not a, he doesn't have the film that you would want to be bragging about or anything like that, but he also hasn't looked like a total asshole out there either. He's gotten better <laughs> you know, the more he's been out there. So um, there's that as well. And you know, both of those guys, whether they wind up as starters or depth, I, I can be okay with. You add in the two additional with Darian Beavers and Micah McFadden, and it, somewhere in there are two starters that I feel are okay and two depth guys that I feel are are better than what we had before. Well, I think the goal of this draft for year one is to either find your starters for the intermediate future or find guys who can hold the fort down until we get those guys next year and the year after. Absolutely. Again, this is not a one-year build. We've been saying this all along, but we, we, do, we want to minimize as much as possible having guys starting that should not be on an NFL roster. We want just a bare minimum – Someone who can just hold the position down for 17 games. And I think we've done that almost everywhere. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and, and let's get into this last little bit here, the strongly considered category, the positions well, I highlighted. Oh, go ahead. Well, wait a minute. Before we get into that, I actually had in my needs, I had said wide receiver. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So that was in my strongly considered. So let's go into that. In your needs, you had wide receiver. Now, yes. they went out and got Wandale Robinson from Kentucky. Um Wandell Robinson is the pick that drew the most ire from Giants fans. And before we get into the guy here, um, I, I think a lot of that ire came from Giants fans uh, not viewing wide receiver as a position of need and getting too caught up in the picking position, not picking player. Now, I understand that there are specific instances where you could say, what about Leo Chanel? We all agree in inside linebacker is important, whatever. Look, I, and those are those are kind of valid, but again, you don't perceive the team needs the same way that mm-hmm. Joe Shane does, that Brian Dable does. You know what I mean? Right. Brian Dable is the head coach right now. He's an offensive guy, and for him, maybe getting a playmaker is just more important than getting an inside linebacker when you already have Blake Martinez. Well, you can kind of knock that one down a little bit, maybe. I think a lot of people also were trying to connect the dots to the Kadarius Tony story, also, because you know well, this yeah. guy. This guy's a twitchy guy. This guy is, you know, he's small, um, you know, that and they, and they immediately made the jump to, well, maybe these Kadarius Tony stories are true. Wasted pick from last year. Everybody's still gun shy from Gettleman. 
So I think you have that complete combination. Now, when we talked about you know needs and wants and all that, I said wide receiver was a big need because I looked at the I looked at the room and I said I can't really rely on anybody here right now. You know, not I only see, that, none of them were really going to be anything after this year anyway. Exactly. You know, I see I see a room where Sterling Shepard had a pretty significant injury and is coming back. Kadarius Tony, you know, forget the, you know whatever the stories were about him, but the, he also has problems getting on the field. You know, so to me, it was a room that really needed a booster and an upgrade. And I think a lot of people figured, well, we drafted in the first round last year and all these other needs. Why are we wasting our time? But I went to bed Friday night feeling better that we have another weapon in that room. And a weapon he is, man. Now, I mean, the biggest knock on him is that he's five foot eight and that's a serious knock. Um, and it's one that I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think is one that you can use to knock somebody so far down your board that you don't end up taking them or, or whatever. But that being said, there were two guys that were five eight and both electric playmakers, and that was Wandell Robinson and Calvin Austin. Now, the reason I never talked about Wandell Robinson is because I just thought Calvin Austin was better. They're kind of just different, and Bobby kind of helped me see that. Um, and, and it's because of the way I value things. Like Calvin Austin is a better route runner than Wandell Robinson. Calvin Austin is a very, very, very precise route runner, and it's part of the reason why he succeeds, even though he's 5'8", is because he gains that separation from having that quickness and from having that superior route running. Now, Wandell Robinson does more with the ball in his hand. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, they're fairly similar. He's not as polished as a route runner, so he can get better there. Um, but when he's got the ball in his fans, he in his hands, he is electric. I, and I know. Ahead, tell me all about it. Let's hear. Yeah, it. because uh, you know Kentucky played Florida last year, and that's an offense that really did next to nothing. And they said, you know, before the broadcast and my you know research before the game that this guy's a game breaker, and you know we're talking about a a uh, Gator secondary that has Kyrie, Kyrie Elam. Elam. Yeah. You know, and he just took a, you know, a simple pass and just went, you know, 40, 45 yards for a touchdown. And the rest of the game, I was petrified. The ball is going to be in his hands again. And again, we're talking about, I, I mentioned it earlier, BFF said he was the, the their top rated receiver in the SEC last year. And the SEC is, you know, the NFL light. For, for talent so it's one of those guys again you know if you can teach route running and you could teach technique having that innate ability just to, to be a playmaker and be the guy on the joystick and if he could be more reliable than Darius Tony you got two of those guys you can do that that's a lot of options for this offense it may be an unconventional offense than we may be used to but speed kills and moves kill yeah, I think too many people don't realize that Kadarius Tony and Wandell Robinson can, in fact, coexist. Kadarius Tony is six sure. feet tall. He can play on the outside. You know what I mean? He is not incapable of playing on the outside. Mm -hmm. He was never con going to be a gadget only or slot only no. receiver. No. I don't. He think. made I think himself he'll excel one. in the slot, sure, but he, that doesn't mean he can't also take reps on the outside. And mm -hmm. Wandell Robinson can do all kinds of stupid, crazy shit because he's a chess piece. It's also insurance because, again, until Kadarius sure. Tony can prove he can be on the field for 17 games, he can't be on the field for 17 games. And you know something? Maybe they do trade him. You know, maybe they did decide they want to move on from him. You know, now you, there's not a there's not a sense of desperation that they have to get rid of him if they really wanted to get rid of rid of him. They have his, you know, his replacement. If you want to call him his replacement, he's on the roster already. So yeah, they just have more options now, and that's what you want for this team you want options you want options on your roster options for moves you can make you know we'll have more options next year with more cap money and all these different things and that's what we're trying the hole we're trying to build out of not just having a crappy roster but the inability to do anything about it yeah and and i i think also that the league values um I think they value the older traits of the proper height and weight and speed um, a little bit less than they do guys who just produce results, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this guy is clearly electric. He clearly gets open enough, 
and what he does with the ball in his hand is rare. There are not a lot of people like that, and therefore he is... I mean, the dude breaks a lot of tackles in addition to... I mean, he just gets a ton of yards after the catch. Most of the film... Most yeah. of the film you saw, like when he's showing his highlights after he was drafted, if you notice who it was against, it was the Georgia game. Mm-hmm. And the last time I checked, they had 73 guys drafted from their defense. Yeah. So he was playing against, you know, again, when you're in the SEC, you're playing Georgia every week. You're playing Florida. You're playing LSU. You're playing the best of the best of the best at the college level. And he made a couple of amazing catches in that Georgia game against a very, very significant talent gap between Georgia and Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah, and and he also came from Oklahoma. That's right. So, um... The pedigree you know. is there. Yeah, sure. Um, that being said, I'm I'm more than happy with Wondell Robinson being on this team. Mm-hmm. I'm happy with it. Uh, sure. The pick at the time certainly confused me. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, wasn't really prepared for them to go in that direction. Um, it confused you because you weren't prepared. Didn't, it wasn't it, prepared. There was I suppose guys, it confusing but, you like, what are we doing? It was more yeah, like it was a, also at the scramble. time we were we were watching the Kobe Dean fall and we didn't know why yet. So there was that as well. We now mm-hmm. later learned that he has such a significant injury history and that he his unwillingness to get surgery on one thing caused teams to shy away. Whatever. Now we know why he fell like crazy. But at the time in the second round, it was like, yo, we could get him right now. That's like insane. You know what I mean? So we were just kind of confused. But that's the difference between that's different. fans, us amateurs and professionals in a room in a war room. They know that information. And all 31 other teams know that information, too. It's just, what is your risk tolerance and what is your gambling? You know, you want to roll the dice and, 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 you know, some teams are in a better position to do that than others. And we are not. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Rounding out the last couple positions here, I had under the strongly consider uh, category, I had safety depth. Because, again, we only had McKinney and Love on the roster. We had nobody else. So right. I, I, I voted that we double dip on safety. Um, defensive line and center. Now, at center, they did bring in John Feliciano. Um, you know, it, it like I said, this got pushed all the way down here because they have something in place where they have a guy they want to use. So they're kind of right. covered. But they got some insurance in the undrafted free agent category. They got Josh Revis from Kansas State, somebody I did do work on, is not very good, but is a capable whatever. I mean, he'll probably be a practice squad guy, just keep a center around. We'll see. Um, but most importantly, was safety depth. And I think that's really what Dane Belton is. Uh, for this year, he'll probably be safety depth. And then based on how he does this year, they'll reassess how they need to address the safety position at the end of the year. I think when Julian Love's contract is up, and they really have a whole year of looking at Dane Belton, what he is, what he could be, and that sort of thing. Um, defensive line, they actually invested fairly significantly. They got DJ Davidson from Arizona State with one of their uh, fourth round picks. Was it the fourth or fifth? It was I, think the it fifth. Was a, I think it was a fifth. Yeah, with their fifth round pick. Um, now, I didn't do anything on DJ Davidson. I didn't. I really didn't spend a lot of time on strictly nose tackles um Mm -hmm. i I spent time on defensive linemen but um yeah he's a big dude holy crap right geez (laughs) six three three hundred and twenty seven pounds he's like a pure run stuffer who can get better with some better coaching and and with some conditioning too i think some of his weight looks a little saggy to me it doesn't look like necessarily good weight um but at the very least, will be rotational run stuffer that can eat up some gaps and stuff like that. And that nose tackle position where they brought in two guys to replace Austin Johnson in that role, and I forget their names. Ellis two is Gators. one. Ellis and – no, well, the, the undrafted free agents, like I said, I don't know. But, yeah, Truesdell was one, and who was the mm-hmm. other one? It's the other Gator they brought in. Uh, there are two guys that were brought in as tr- transfers last year, uh, portal mm-hmm. guys, and – didn't do much, honestly. But again, a lot of that I'm gonna I'm gonna blame on scheme once again. Okay. So, you know, a lot of guys from that Florida defense ended up on roster or you know were either drafted or were undrafted free agents, which tells you that there was talent but was just wasted. Yeah, there just wasn't film. Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, I thought it was Valentino. Kind of... Valentino. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um. So they've, they've kind of 
I guess they with the with the traded pick, they they felt that they could just kind of take a gamble on somebody that maybe they thought maybe this guy is a, a big time nose tackle. You know what I mean? Maybe he'll be he'll be day one depth. You know that he'll mm-hmm. get some use on the field. You know, you figure you trade for the pick, it was basically for free. Mm-hmm. Um, overall, I feel like they matched up most of these things pretty well. The center and but I mean mainly, I feel a little shaky about corner right now. Um, because I don't know what there's so much uncertainty right now. But they could have their own plan. Maybe that's why they don't feel that way, or maybe that was just the the thing that had to shake loose based on the way the board fell. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but so I feel your, pretty good. That, how do how do you feel? That's your biggest concern right now is is corner. Corner is my biggest concern because I think they're one inch. First of all, I don't know what the fuck they're doing at starter. Uh, I really I, I have to. <laughs> I have to assume James Bradbury is gone in one regard or another, and if that's the case, I have no idea who the starter is, what the depth chart is, and uh, what the scheme's going to be. It just and in that scenario, they're one injury away from a total disaster of a season. Um, and you know, Week Martindale also had like one of the most injured secondaries last year. It's part of the system. A lot of blitzing. Those mm-hmm. guys get hit in different ways. Um, so yeah, I, I would say corner is my biggest concern. I would say after that, my biggest concern might be just safety just for the same reasons. I think I agree with you. Yeah, yeah, but I, overall, overall I feel secondary. like it's okay. You you ask how do I feel after everything? I feel I feel it was a great first step in this rebuild process. I you know I know there was a lot of. Uh, talk about trying to trade down for next year Hmm. you know i'm glad that they if you do that you're kind of a little delaying the overall rebuild process if we're really going to be in the market for a quarterback next year we're either going to be horrible this year this is going to necessitate a a decent pick or i have no problem trading away future draft picks to get that guy that they want so I'm glad that they, you know, the two of the main needs that they needed, they addressed with arguably the best at those positions. You know, cornerstone guys that are going to be here for quite a while. Um, you know, I, I think for as far as the other positions are, I think, you know, we, we covered it pretty well. I think there's so many needs on this team. You can't tackle everything. You just try to, you know, you get the best guy you can at the positions of, of need of the most. And I think we've done a pretty good job with that. Time will tell if these guys, you know, do a good job, you know, actually on the field. Are they productive? Are they guys that can, you know, they don't flame out after a year or two? Well, we don't know yet. But I think looking at this over a longer time frame than just this year, I think it was a good start. Yeah, I I actually wholly agree with you. Um, It makes me excited for the next draft in a way because i'm just interested in that and how they view the next step that was um, going to be my question for you next was i'm how excited are you about the process of how we got to what happened as opposed to just the picks like they kind of had a plan you know they wanted to trade down and get more picks you know, doing it that way are you just overall are you happy with the process that they're using and the process this team seems to be taking right now I mean, it's a little early for me to answer that, but I think so. Um, but also, I have to you have to understand that, that Joe Shane came in here and he brought in his guy. It's like, I, I mean, everybody kind of had to come up to speed on the plan so much as go into the offseason with the plan, right? Mm-hmm. It'll be a different fl- – and, and again, working with guys that they knew they weren't going to be working with going forward, that they mm-hmm. just kind of had to ride out this offseason with and then fire them and, and retain whoever and then maybe grab guys for whatever. But what I'm saying is it's not going to function that same way as opposed to in a year from now when they've, they're they agreeing on a plan, they're formulating the plan throughout the, the actual NFL season, and when that season ends, they are fluidly going right along with the plan. It and, will, and they're also, It'll function better. And they're also going to know their own roster so much better. I mean, right oh, now all they yeah. know is what they've seen on tape from – with a different coaching staff, a different scheme, different philosophy, they're going to have 12 months of this coaching staff to evaluate them on what they are trying to do. So I think once you have a better grip on what you currently have, that's going to impact what you're going to do going forward in free agency, in the draft, picking up undrafted free agents, and all, you know, all the ways you build a roster. That 
is right. So I am going to now spend my week going through these draft picks much, much more. Um, the guys I already did work on, I'm going to do more work on. The guys I don't know anything about, I'm going to do work on. And we're going to clean up who is an undrafted free agent, who was a workout, who was this, that, and the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, and by next episode, we'll have a more comprehensive breakdown of the draft and how these players are going to fit into, or at least how I think, we think, these players are going to fit into the depth chart, the roster, how they're going to be used, that sort of thing. Um, and mm -hmm. what their future is going to be like here, right? I mean, some guys are probably going to be a for now solution, while mm -hmm. others are a possible a building stone here. Yeah, right. exactly. So we'll get into all that. I'm going to be doing that work throughout the week. You might want to follow me on Twitter, where I might point out some of these things, little uh, videos on the players as I do the work. So be sure to follow me at football underscore grump. The Cranky Fan has some cool stuff. Uh, going on potentially in the works. Yeah. Um, I don't know if I you know, can talk you about it yet. But. Yeah, none of you people care, I'm sure, but I am going to be on a podcast coming up talking about my beloved Rays and Lightning, so I don't have to bother you guys about it, but if you want to hear another side of me, a, a, a different side of my passion besides just the Giants, I'll give out the information next week, but... Uh, I'll be working on that as well, in addition to obviously all the stuff for this show. Um, but, and we got a lot of stuff coming on, you know, with our show coming up, uh, a lot of exciting things happening. So um, I guess the biggest thing for us is, you know, we appreciate you guys listening and watching. You know, if you could give us a five star rating on Apple, subscribe to us on YouTube. Those are the two best things that help kind of get the word out for us, um, you know, and get more people to watch and, interact with us because the more people we do the you know the better experiences for everybody so we'd appreciate that Hell and where do they find yeah. us Grump? yeah of course this show is available on youtube of course but also an audio version is on soundcloud itunes spotify google play etc anywhere you listen to podcasts our podcast is there but it's also on twitter as well at just giants pond so you can follow there as well um that is gonna do it for this episode we'll see you guys next week go giants go giants